Welcome back, honors. All right, so you will notice a very similar background to the CP flip and stuff like that. Well, it's mainly just because I use the same presentation for this unit because I teach it at like a borderline AP level uh, just because I like it a lot. So you guys, though, will be doing much more, as always, with uh, the content. You have multiple essays on your test, uh, correctable Napoleon, true and false, and then also not to mention the fact that you'll, of course, probably have, oh, I don't know, probably another essay coming up sometime soon. All right, so anyway, now, continuing forward, though. So, we left off in class talking about the flight to Varenne and the terribly botched plan to try and actually get the heck out of Dodge when it came to the royal family of France, right? And they're going to try and run away to Varenne, or they're trying to get to Austria, but they're going to be captured at Varenne, France, right? So, this is, of course, them storming into this farmhouse and getting Louis and throwing him on this table and freaking out and, like, beating him up a bunch, apprehending him, and then deporting him back to Paris, right? So due to this entire shenanigans, though, this thing is going to form. It's called the Paris mob, right? So the Paris mob begins to kind of slowly roam the streets. Now, this isn't a technical term. You're not going to see this in any history books, really. I like to start here, though, because it gives more, like, flow to this whole thing. But the news of the king's flight has now destroyed any remaining popularity he has with the people of Paris. Some of y'all are probably immediately like, wait a minute, he was popular at all? Yes, Nikki Del Rey, he was popular. I know that this is like one of your big things, all right? So it's kind of like, uh, for example, it's there were still some people that wanted a king, right? They wanted a king but they just didn't know what form they wanted that king to take, right? So they did a lot of different things. Like, for example, at one point they called Louis, oh, we're not going to be, he's not going to be the king of France. He's going to be the French king, and they're going to change his title a bunch and stuff. But his popularity is now finally shot, right? Even so much so that literally the popular press, of course led by none other than Marat, right? The very famous writer Marat, who actually uh, hid down in the sewers for years, uh, Jean-Paul Marat. Uh, so the family per, um, was portrayed very oftenly as pigs, right? So that is the only image that he would actually put into his newspaper, right? So going forward, though, this is what the Parisian mob looked like. It was a roaming band of urban working men, right? So some of you will immediately notice they look like prisoners or they look like they're wearing pajamas, right? Let's make sure that we distinguish these two things, all right? They are not prisoners. They're not wearing pajamas, all right? So what they are wearing, first of all, this is a little tricolor cockade that's on his cap, right? And it's a pauper's hat, right? Now, pauper's hats, of course, were a symbol of the revolution, right? So that's one imagery. No, it's not a sleeping cap, so he's not in his pajamas. Second of all, the striped clothes that they're wearing. Some of y'all are immediately saying, oh, that's why I thought they might be prisoners. No. These striped clothing became another uniform of the French Revolution because many urban workers would actually wear this particular attire, right? So, all right, so, ooh, whoop, what the heck? All right, now, so urban workers would wear this very, very dexterous cloth, all right, that would stand up to a lot of abuse, and you would know a factory worker when you saw one before the revolution because they would always be wearing this type of clothing, right? So the roaming mob decided we're going to wear the working clothes of our people. We're going to move through the streets. We're going to find wealthy people, ask them for money and bread. If they don't give it to us, we're going to kill them, all right? So, but then for a second, these urban working men kind of, take a break, you know, probably, you know, take a breather, have a couple of, a couple of cups of coffee and just kind of sitting around and they're going, wait a minute. The wealthy are running in fear of us. Uh, we have demands. We're sick and tired of all this national assembly garbage that none of us are in, first of all. You know what I mean? It's all bourgeois members. None of us are involved. They want constitutions, appeals, trials, blah, 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 that we don't necessarily understand nor want to explain to our people. Our revolutionary goals are simple. We want to be fed. We want some bread. Yeah, all right. So they want bread, safety, equality.
quality, right? So they decide for a second, they say, we should have a name. We should have a name. We should have a group. We should have a club of our own, right? So they begin to call themselves the Sans Culos, right? Now, I know there's supposed to be another S right there, so go ahead and throw that other S in there. So Sans Culos, just a typo. Now, anyway, the Sans Culos members begin to band together because at the beginning of the revolution, the working men of Paris allowed the revolutionary bourgeois to actually be in charge, right? So, and are they still pretty much in charge? Yes, but this Sans Culos becomes basically a militia of the radicals, right? And I know I just literally heard some people like a hard hops just now. Like, oh, wow, dang. Okay. Uh, yeah. A militia of the radicals. That's right, Angelica. I said it, right? This is going to be basically the thing the radical revolutionaries always wanted. The people who love violence, they love this idea. They love the idea that there's a roaming band of poor people going around ready to murder on the spot, right? Ready to kill for the revolution in a moment. And guess what? The Sans Culos were also not binary. They did not discriminate. Women could be a part of it. Men could be a part of it. It did not matter. Yeah, that's right. Some of those women from the Women's March on Versailles, those angry fish moms, they're coming into the Sans Culos, right? Open enrollment for all. And the crazy part about it, though, is that by 1790, right? It's actually really more like 1791. But by about 1791, the Sans Culos are beginning to become politically active. They're beginning to become a leading facet of the revolution because they are encouraging violence, right? They become an element that now the rea the relaxed revolutionaries have to kind of like deal with, right? So now let's talk about where their name comes from, all right? So let's talk about what sans culos means in English, okay? What sans culos me means in English, write this down underneath it, literally without britches, all right? Britches, like as in like tight, form-fitting, rich man pants, all right? Fancy pants, if you will. And some of y'all are like, wait a minute, Mr. Terry. You're telling me that these people are running around with no pants on? All right, so no, they're not like the no pants gang. They're not going like full toddler and wearing only a t-shirt, all right? So they're actually referring to themselves because a Sans Culos member looks like this, all right? I know some of y'all are like, well, what about those two other bullet points? They're not that important. It's literally just stuff I've already said, all right? So now, anyway, so it means without britches, all right? Because they wore loose-fitting, working men's striped trousers, right? They wore the attire of the poor. And there you can see his tricolor cockade, right? Like the image of the revolution. So that is what a Sans Culos member looks like, right? Carrying a spear, carrying a sword, sometimes carrying a gun, right? But guns, like, they take reloading and all kinds of other stuff like that. And then this is what your bourgeois looked like. Those are britches, all right? So these are britches. Britches came down to your knees. They were form-fitting. They had to be tailor-made, right? And then you had long stockings that went up underneath them, all right? So sometimes some little bows on the sides. And then an ascot. And then also, of course, multiple layers of clothing that the Sans Culos couldn't afford, right? So they called themselves the Sans Culos, which means literally without pants or without britches, all right? So, but they are very, very violent people without bridges, all right? So going forward though, this of course is where we've already discussed, this is the palace of which they are being held in, right? So within the Tuileries, the royal family is under lock and key, house arrest actually, all right? So here is the crazy part. One of the initial actions of the Sans Culos is to attack the Tuileries, right? The royal family is living under house arrest in the Tuileries palace and an angry mob by June 20th breaks into that building led by the Sans Culos members, right? They find their way to the king and they drag him out into the streets, right? Now, a lot of you are like, oh yeah, let's go. This is where they're going to execute him. Not yet. This was much more of a public display, right? This was a display of the Sans Culos ability to sway the revolution at any moment and to actually, you know, show that they could get to the king at any moment if they so felt like, right? So they could jump in there and attack the king if they so felt like, right? Because they're recruiting members of the military into the Sans Culos. They're recruiting women. They're trying to show their physical dominance, right? And to try and insult the king, they decide to publicly embarrass him. And I know immediately some of the boys are like, Evan Schwantes and Taylor and all them are like, what are you gonna do, pants him? <laughs> get it? Sans Culos. King, 
handsome. No, they're not going to do that. But what they do instead is they force him to wear one of those caps of the revolution, right? They drag him out and they put that thing on his head and the news media goes in a circus. They freak out, all right? They are flipping out left and right and be like, look, look, the king's wearing a revolutionary cap. How hilarious is that? They're trying to show the authority of which he does not have anymore. Do dozens, dozens of people died at this attack on the Tuileries. The ultimate irony about the attack on the Tuileries is that in our revolution, we're like, oh, we had a war with the Brits. You know what I mean? We had a war with the Brits just because we wanted some freedom. No taxation without representation. Ha ha. The French killed dozens of people for a hat. All right. So like, that's pretty scary when you think about it. All right. Now, going forward into it, though. Another way that they try to show their dominance, come here, baby. Come here, baby. Hey, hey. They try to get a new flag, right? So following the attack on the Tuileries and following all these revolutionary movements, the French flag is officially going to be changed. So this one right here was the old French flag. The, uh, what you call it? The fleur de lis. Come here. The fleur de lis were a symbol of the royal ruling house of France, particularly the Bourbon, right? So they decide that they're going to instead adopt this new flag. And, oh, come on. Fine. You know, fun. All right. So anyway, adopt this new flag that shows liberty and equality and tries to show the flanking of the people around the outside of the king, right? So the king was represented in white and the colors of Paris in red and blue, right? So, and then those were adopted by the military actually later on, showing the king being balanced out on either side by his people. Right? So, then you're going to see this. Some of you are like, all right, so we've had some radical, we've had some relaxed, we have some radical, we had some relaxed. We are finally now going to give these radical and relaxed revolutionaries a name. All right? They have names now, finally. So, some of you are like, wait, they didn't have names already? Well, not early on because they hadn't broken up into clubs yet. Right? So, we had the rise of these things called clubs. Now, the clubs have been around for forever. They had been actually around long before the revolution ever even really began, right? So clubs were basically groups of free-thinking people, mostly of bourgeois members, who would get together and discuss how they're going to change their political, like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, their political situation in France. So the thing about it is some of y'all are immediately like, oh, so it's like a salon. This is like a salon in secret, all right? Because... If you were caught having a club, you could be executed under the bourbons before all this happened, right? So two new radical clubs are going to pop up. Now, when I say radical, I don't mean they're both... That's a terrible way to actually say this. Two new clubs pop up, all right? One had been around for a really long time. One of them was actually born inside of the other one and then came out and made its own thing. So buckle your seatbelts. Let's figure this out, all right? So two... Cross out radical, but new groups arise, okay? These two groups that are going to begin to compete for power are called the Jacobins and the Girondins, all right? So the Jacobins were the original group, okay? The big, threatening, imposing, scary, violent group, right? They side with the mob. They encourage more violence, all right? So they want... Sans culottes. When the Sans culottes was formed, the Jacobin Club was like, ha, 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 gets them. All right. So, whereas the Girondins were actually born of the Jacobin Club, they were originally a faction within the Jacobin Club because the Jacobin Club is so big. All right. So, the Jacobin Club actually ended up having two big groups within it. One was called the Montagnards because they sat high up on these benches because Montagnard in French means the mountain. All right, so they were like, oh, we're the mountain, we're up here. And the Girondins started inside of the Jacobin Club, and they were like, well, you know, we kind of want this violence to calm down. We want the Declaration of the Rights of Man. We want the night of August the 4th, right? We want the, the no great fear. We need calmness. We need productful calm, right? They resist the violence. They try to calm down the revolution, right? And they are born within the Jacobin Club, right? So... If you ever want a way to remember them, relate them to a couple of cartoon characters, right? The Girondins remind me a lot of Gary from SpongeBob, all right? So Gary is very chill. He's very calm. He's reserved. He's relaxed. He says meow a lot, right? 
He's not doing a whole lot. He's a Girondin. He's very relaxed. Whereas on the other hand, Jerry Jacobin is a lot like the Jacobins in a, in a, in a nutshell. Very, very violent. Very, very aggressive, right? Beats up a cat with a frying, plant, frying pan, shoves his tail into a light socket. Does a lot of really mean stuff, right? So that's the Jacobin cartoon character, Jerry, right? So going into this, though, the Jacobins are going to be having a field day with an event called the September Massacres, right? So during this entire phase, the French are recruiting a military because they're very, very upset with the fact that the Austrians were probably about to aid the rules, right? They were about to help out the royal family and actually progress and try to suppress the revolution, right? And so they're getting real fired up right now. And they're like, the Austrians, we're going to end up going to war with those guys, right? I think we can take the Austrians. We're fired up. And then they start hearing that a bunch of other European countries might help the Austrians, right? And they're like, I'm still fired up. I think we can take them. But like, but wait a minute. We have all these people in these prisons that are enemies of our revolution, right? They're aristocrats of the second estate. They're former sword nobles, right? They're, uh, they're the priests from the civil constitution of the clergy that refuse to take the oath of allegiance, right? If the Austrians got here, they could go to the prisons and recruit new members of their army to help fight the revolution. Oh, no, no, no. So a roaming group of poor particularly sans culottes members, began to go into every prison within Paris and actually empty the prisoners out into the streets and execute them in alleyways, chasing them all over the place and things like that. September massacre casualties. Let's find out how many people were actually executed. I think it's a pretty high number. Yep, more than a thousand people killed in 20 hours. All right, so... With this entire thing, by like half of the prison population of Paris is going to be emptied out into the streets and publicly executed in very vile and grotesque ways with axes and swords and pikes and a lot of other crazy things. And the sad part is, is the Jacobins encouraged this, right? They wanted it. They told them to keep going. So the monarchy following this, though, and its inability to actually control the government going in for, into this is going to be officially abolished. Right? So there is now no more monarchy of France. Okay? The king and the queen are officially arrested. And since there's now a lot of room in these prisons, they're going to be some of its newest members. Okay? So since the constitutional monarchy is now over and the Declaration of Rights of Man and what it was trying to do all Magna Carta style, there you go, it's going to be abolished and France is going to become a republic. Right? What they're going to call themselves is the French First Republic. Right? So, the new government is considered the French First Republic. And as a showing of their awesomeness, dexterity, and amazing will to fight against everything, they decide, you know what? We're going to go to war. Right? So, they decide to declare war on Austria. Right? And in this, this is called the War of the First Coalition. Right? Now, let's talk about a coalition real fast. Right? Coalitions are groups of people. So the coalition was actually Austria, Great Britain, Holy Roman Empire, uh, parts of Italy, right? They decide to link up together and they are going to fight the French and actually suppress this revolution together. This seems like a cut and dry victory for the coalition armies. But what ends up happening is under their new two-party leadership, they actually win. Their new government had major victories. It took five different coalition losses, and finally a sixth one when they beat Napoleon. But yeah, France was five and one against coalition armies. That's insane. But they also had a draft and like a lot of other stuff going for them. But their new government had major victories. They invaded parts of Germany, Egypt, and even Austria, right? So the Egypt invasion was kind of a failure because it was like Napoleon's big, like one of his big failures, but he doesn't like to talk about it. All right, so speaking of this entire thing, Napoleon was a general, an, an or what you call it, an artillery general during these wars, right? During these wars of the First Coalition, the Second Coalition, the Third Coalition, and they had major victories, right? So now not only is there no monarchy in France anymore, and they're now prisoners, but also the new government is winning? It's like you got a new coach, and all of a sudden it's just like, and you're going, right? So during this thing back at home, 
They also begin to create these things to keep the people happy, to keep the Sans Kalos members all riled up and keep them excited, right? They begin to have revolutionary tribunals, okay? What a revolutionary tribunal is, it was created by both the Girondins and the Jacobins to put political leaders on trial, particularly members of the royal family, uh, the second estate members that were in these prisoners, the prisons that actually survived. They actually talk about the revolutionary tribunals in a very, very famous book called The Tale of Two Cities. Gianna, I know you're reading that. So, and then, usually these result in death, all right? So, no appeal system whatsoever. There is a jury, but it's very biased. It's made up of Jacobin and Girardin members. And the trials particularly hate the royal family and members of the former second estate. And these are not calm trials. They look like this. They are insane. They're huge. Their membership is gigantic. There are people throwing things, yelling, screaming. Uh, people, every time they go to vote for death, people chanting, death, death, like just like flipping out. It is not what you would imagine as a calm proceeding. It is very, 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 very intense, okay? The judge would usually sit up on high, and their accusers would all be directly facing the accused, right? It's a very intense, a very, very intense thing. And then to go along with these new revolutionary tribunals, a nice new device was brought in. It's called the guillotine, right? So the guillotine is going to be brought in. Now the guillotine looks like this, okay? The guillotine was brought in for one key reason, and you need to write this down. It was considered equal. Invented by a man named Guillotine, it's actually the last name of its inventor, this device was considered the new method of egalitarian execution. Egalitarian means it's equal, all right? So because before the revolution ever began, the wealthy could sometimes buy their way out of execution. Or, the, you know, they would be summarily put to death, like, poison, or, you know, quickly, or, like, in a less, in a no torture, no pain kind of way, right? Whereas the poor always received the worst punishments. Torture, the racking wheel, uh, hanging, when you think about it, is one of the most messed up ways to go, right? That's how they were put to death. And so the revolution decides we're tired of this. If you're going to be put to death in our country, in this revolution, you're all going to be put to death the exact same way with this new device, the guillotine, right? So to explain the way it works, about eight feet tall, very, very large device, right? A, a lot of people believe it's so it can be seen, right? So the ones I've seen are about eight feet tall anyway. Let's uh, look up really, really quickly, just double check. Uh, guillotine height. Not a guillotine haircut. That sounds terrifying. Weighs about 80 kilograms is the blade. Ooh, some of them could be as high as 14 feet. All right, so that thing's cooking. All right, so very, very, very large device though, right? So with this, the person would be laid on this bench and the guillotine was painted red on purpose to actually hide the blood stains, right? It's a very simple device and your hair would usually be shaved beforehand so it doesn't gunk up all the mechanisms be laid on the bench, the stock would come down, hold the person's neck in place, pull the lever, 14 feet of blade drops, right? Cooks up a lot of speed, bang, head falls off into a basket, right? And then the seat would be lifted up, the body would be slid off, and the next person would be up for execution. This thing was also very, very efficient and fast, all right? You could execute multiple numbers of people a day. Right? and not have to worry about resetting anything. So it was actually equal and efficient. All right? So moving forward, though, the guillotine is going to see one of its earliest victims in the king. The National Convention is going to decide to put Louis on trial for his crimes. Most seriously, treason against the revolution. Right? And unfortunately, the Jacobins outnumbered the Girondins. The Girondins actually did not vote for his execution. They did vote for his guilt, but they never voted for his execution. And the Jacobins outnumbered them, and by a very narrow margin, they actually voted for his death, right? So, and on in January of 1793, Louis is going to be executed, and at the scaffold, he said, I forgive those who are guilty of my death. So he, to this, like, up until his death, did not even say that he, des like, basically never claimed that he deserved it whatsoever. And the sad part is, that's not right, it's his grandfather. The sad part is, is he was executed in the Palace de Concorde that his grandfather had built. Next to a statue of his grandfather, Louis XV, 
looking down upon the guillotine, he was executed, beheaded, and one of the executioners grabbed his head out of the basket and showed it to the crowd, right? So as you can see, things are getting insane. They are not stopping here. We are all up in the radical phase. If you actually ask most historians, there are four phases of the French Revolution. The first one is the liberal phase, which is the National Assembly phase. The second one is the radical phase, of which we're in now. The third one's the directory phase, which is awful and boring. And the fourth one is the Napoleonic phase, which is my favorite. All right, so we're going to stop here, though. I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you guys on Monday.